so just to get started, um, I would like to kind of um, start with a question of um, what's the most amazing, what's the most diverse chassis that you can possibly work on? And so those of you that's been, that been working on RNA folding or um, folding of other biomolecules or solving any other biological problem for biomedical or uh, basic research purposes, would probably say that the most fascinating and diverse thing a person can work on is life cell, it is a biological system. And that's partially true, because if you look at the world um, of biology, there is so many different forms, shapes, types of biochemistry, types of tools that we can use, um, that it seems like biology is this incredibly diverse, um, almost infinitely diverse uh, set of chassis set of molecules set of parts that you can play with and things that you have to figure out but when you look at it from the evolutionary point of view and from the point of view of the basic biochemistry you realize that all of natural biology and all of biological sciences until now were actually done on a sample size that equals one because we only have one type of modern terrestrial life we only have one known type of life one kind of cell so all of the ribosome engineering work done to date and all of the other bioengineering work, all of the work that you've done on folding biomolecules, folding RNA and other molecules that all have been done on a single chassis, that of a single cell that came from the last universal common ancestor. This is all of the biology we know right now. And this is kind of a rationale for the field of synthetic cell engineering. Um, we know that we only have one cell, we only have one type of biology. And so what our field wants to do is we want to build a chassis for true bioengineering, for making molecules, for making uh, pathways, making higher order structures happen in a way that's not tied to, not limited to, or by um, the design constraints of the cells that come from modern biology. And when you look at it from the engineering point of view, um, cells are incredibly complex and we really have no idea what's going on in there. Um, those of you who did more reading on the actual book, on the kind of biochemical basis of biomolecule folding, you realize that folding of molecules is not just dependent on the sequence and structure of the molecule itself, but also everything else that's going on around it. So for example, if you want to design a better ribosome or different kind of a ribosome, you need to take into account the entire biomolecular environment that the ribosome lives in, and that is the whole cell. And the whole cell is so incredibly complex that we still don't have a complete biochemical model of even the simplest possible living cell. And so this is where the field of synthetic cell engineering comes in. Um, we decided that, um, not decided, kind of realized that um, that natural life cell is too complex to engineer too complex to reverse engineer so we decided to kind of start with a blank chassis and build a cell from scratch and that's kind of the premise of the field is we want to build synthetic cells so that we can then design biochemical systems in any way and form possible and later today in the section you'll hear um, some very detailed good talks about engineering one part of that chassis, which is the ribosome, arguably one of the most important parts of that chassis, because engineering the translation system, you're essentially engineering the entire uh, building machinery that um, directs structure, architecture, and to some extent the kinetics of the biochemistry of that whole living system. So this is kind of one applied example of this whole bigger problem of how to engineer a cell. How the hell can you engineer something as complex as a whole living cell? So what is a synthetic cell really? Well, nobody knows because we haven't made one yet, but the uh, kind of a basic recipe for what a synthetic cell is, is something that looks and behaves not unlike a modern terrestrial cell, so the cells that we all represent, but is made from different building blocks, is organized just slightly different. And in a way, um, because we're using what we have at hand, uh, we're building synthetic cells from the modern biological building blocks. So we're still using, most of us, um, I say I'm just one member of this big diverse field, but most of us are still using um, components given by nature. And as you'll hear um, in a talk from someone from my Jewett's lab, um, they're using 
cell extracts that are made from mostly from bacteria that contain ribosomes and all of the other um, biomolecules necessary for the translation from the bacterial ribosome. Synthetic cells most of the time look like regular cells, so they have a lipid bilayer. Um, we're using lipids just because this is a very easy, conveniently available building block to make um, cells, to make synthetic cells, also to make cells that are engineered natural cells. So it's basically um, kind of like a building block for a compartment, for a membrane surrounding all the biochemistry that we're really interested in. Uh, we're using a whole bunch of small molecules uh, to make peptides, to make RNA, to make DNA, to affect folding of some of those biomolecules. Um, that includes affecting folding of RNA and DNA uh, by small molecules, affecting folding of proteins. And then we're using um, the genes right now, mostly classical DNA that encodes all the information that we want those cells to express. And in some way, um, you can think of a synthetic cell as sort of a biological jigsaw puzzle, because we can make synthetic cells out of building blocks that come from every known domain of life. And if you think about engineering a new ribosome, a new kind of a translation machinery, you should think about um, not only what kind of polymers that ribosome is going to make, but also what organisms the building blocks for that ribosome can come from. And that's the same is true for any other component of a living cell. So we can make synthetic cells that use components from any known organism, and that's a lot of that's been done in order to kind of expand the toolbox, expand the repertoire of what we can do with uh, the synthetic cell technology. And some of the examples of why we bother doing it. Um, one, because it's incredibly cool, although I'm obviously biased because I think this is the coolest part of science. Um, some people might disagree. Um, I believe they're wrong, but it's that technology itself is more of a platform. It's used for whatever you want it to use. And that's why the synthetic cell technologies have connections to um, a lot of different fields, both basic research and applied research. Um, that's why I'm really interested in what you guys are doing, because you're having tools to solve some of the biological problems, that those puzzles that we cannot solve using natural cells or using the classical bioengineering tools. So you can basically apply any kind of, take any kind of a biological question or biological problem and see if you can solve it first on this model system, on this simple synthetic cell model system. And some of the applications of this technology that have been demonstrated so far are um, using synthetic cells to produce new materials. And that strongly uh, overlaps with the theme of this session, which is engineering ribosomes, to make new materials, to make new kinds of biopolymers that are not made by natural life cells. You need a ribosome that's not going to hesitate, hesitate to chew on um, building blocks that normal ribosomes, natural ribosomes wouldn't take to make different kinds of bonds, not just peptide bonds, but other kinds of chemical bonds that can create new kinds of polymers. Uh, we're also using synthetic cells as a chassis for biocomputing. Uh, synthetic cells, because they're pretty much as dead as you want them to be when you make them, they don't have um, those billions of years of evolution behind them. They don't follow any sort of pre-described evolutionary program. They can be used as a pretty efficient biocomputing chassis because they don't have all those orthogonal pathways that every cell, every adult cell has um, to ensure it survives, it replicates, it evolves. As synthetic cells, they're dumb, they're dead, they do whatever you want them to do. And so they're really good chassis to, for example, resolve bi Boolean logic gates, biological Boolean logic gates, because those pathways that you want to express for the biological computation don't interfere with any other essential pathways that are essential to life, um, because synthetic cells are so simple. Uh, the technology is also used for some uh, kind of more far off esoteric applications, like figuring out the origin of life, because synthetic cells are the simplest, uh, most trackable, deconstructed forms of metabolism, of biochemical metabolism possible. Uh, we're using them for practical purposes of things like space exploration. If one day we want to put humans on Mars and beyond Mars, we want to have those biocomputing and metabolic engineering platforms that will support autonomous colonies, autonomous spaceships for months to years at a time. 
And synthetic cells are a really good tool for that, for making molecules on demand on a short notice. So for example, if you want to send a human to Mars, um, humans are not going to grow potatoes on Mars right away, despite um, what movies want us to believe. Um, for many reasons, potatoes would not grow on Mars um, in, on the current state of the Mars regolith. But synthetic cells don't care about the biochemical environment, what we see within physical chemical limitations of the biomolecules themselves. So you can imagine using synthetic cells to make nutrients, make drugs, make uh, components in extreme environments. And then last but not least, and that's something really important to you as a community, um, synthetic cells have been demonstrated in biomedical applications. You can think of them as essentially infinitely programmable bioreactors that can be injected into living organisms. And our field demonstrated that you can inject synthetic cells into alive mice and shrink tumors in live mice. So this is kind of where the field is right now. We have proof of, proofs of principle of therapeutics based on that technology. And so there's also um, a lot of other kind of more um, esoteric far out there applications, but the kind of take home message is that you can think of synthetic cells as a chassis for any kind of a design, biological design um, archit or architecture building that you want. And in a context of this session, this day could be platform for engineering better, faster, more promiscuous ribosomes, or they can be a chassis for engineering any other kind of biological systems. And so the reason I'm here is because I want to introduce you to the community of people that decided that engineering synthetic cells is not something that a single country or a single community um, can do. And so we self-organized into this, this uh, Kind of an open science collaboration called Build a Cell. We're completely open, completely voluntary science collaboration that focuses on all aspects of engineering synthetic cells, and that includes um, corrupting, recruiting people into our to our side, to our cause, convincing people that this is um, the bioengineering, biomanufacturing, biomedical engineering tool that we need to invest time and resources into to really overcome the the um, design and kind of principal limitations of using live cells as the chassis. Uh, recently, we managed to self-reproduce, um, build a cell sprouted, a um, local build a cell South America chapter. And what we do most of the time is we try to work as a community, which in a way is not that different than what your community is doing. So what we do is, first of all, um, we acknowledge that everyone in the community has different goals. Um, we all want to see synthetic cell be, become a reality, but we all have different ways to approach that goal. Um, we all have different ways of different ideas of why we should make a synthetic cell, how we should make a synthetic cell. So we don't define life. Um, I know someone's itching to ask me, how do you know you're done? How do you know what life is? And I can answer that question right away saying, we don't know what life is. We don't define it. We all just focus on the experiments and focus on the results and want to get as close to that living system as possible without actually making any limits and limiting definitions that could exclude someone from our field. What most of what we're doing is we're coordinating research efforts. Um, we coordinate right now academic research efforts. So research in labs that are focused on making synthetic cells, testing synthetic cells, developing applications for synthetic cells. We do outage and education. We want the general public to realize that building synthetic cells is something that is actually good and needed to be done instead of invoking this idea of we're crazy scientists making life from scratch and that's gonna kill the world. Um, it will not kill the world. Hopefully it will save the world at least partially, um, at least help it. Uh, we're working on science policy. We're working on um, convincing the people that have power and money that scientific community needs to be um, invested in, needs to be helped to work together. And we're also trying to convince the people um, in charge that certain scientific questions are not a matter of um, concern for a one country or one community, but instead they're global problems, they're global challenges that we can solve as a global community. And last one, but not least, um, we want to do it safely. And the reason I'm talking to you on Zoom and not in person is obviously a bug that got out of control. Here, we're making new bugs, but we want to make sure that we're doing it safely and we want to make sure that we pay attention to not just biosafety, but also biosecurity implications of this technology. 
So who we are, um, these are the people that are on our steering group. So we are the people responsible for all the mistakes that the, the Build the Soul community does. Um, all the mem other, other members are the people that are actually doing the useful good work. And most of that work is done through uh, workshops. We meet, we used to meet every six months. Um, we haven't met in person as a community for over um, a year now. Our last workshops, workshop one was on Zoom, and we were hoping to resume in-person workshops um, later this year. We'll see how it goes. But if anyone wants to join the community, you can always show up to our workshops. Um, the workshops are open. There's no registration fee. Anyone can just walk up, introduce themselves, and spend a day with us. Uh, what do we do during those in-person workshops is we mostly work on setting up a stage for things that we will be doing in between the workshops, which is the working groups. Um, everything we do is open source. So everything that Build the Self produces, all the documents, all the protocols, um, white papers, published papers, this is all available to the community and to the world um, free of charge on our websites. Everything is going to be disseminated publicly. One example of the thing um, that we as a community came together and engineered is a hopefully foolproof liposome um, assembly protocol. For those of you who have done um, bench science, you know that making liposomes is relatively challenging, especially making it reproducibly. And this is one of the things our community addressed. Um, and we're using this kind of a distributed um, system of validating protocols, collecting feedback, validating again, and publishing it all again, open access free for everyone. Um, another protocol that our community is working on is very relevant to this session is we're working on the self-free translation protocol, which um, is used not just in ribosome engineering, but also to use those engineered ribosomes. Um, right now, we're very grateful to the National Science Foundation for the, for the support um, for our research coordination network. And the main uh, way we get any work done is working groups. So if anyone is interested in any build cell activities, any synthetic cell engineering activities, you're always invited to talk to us, um, join our Slack, um, come to our seminars, but mostly join our working groups. And this is kind of a snapshot of working groups as they are as of right now. Um, working groups kind of fluctuate their living organisms that change the membership changes as the groups accomplish their goals and move on. Sometimes groups sprout into subgroups, um, sometimes subgroups merge into another group. It's kind of a living environment where we try to get work done as fast as possible, as efficiently as possible, not only when we meet in person, but also in between those um, biannual meetings. Uh, we meet once a week uh, for seminar series, um, online, obviously. Um, every week on Monday, we have a research or policy or outreach seminar. We run a mentorship program just to kind of connect junior people to senior people in a field and help people build their careers in our field. And the most important thing that we want to do is um, bring people together. We want to integrate all the efforts of biological engineering community towards building a synthetic cell. And by the community, I mean every single person that's interested in it. So we're not just a US-based organization. We're not North America based organization, we try at least to try to be a worldwide organization at this point, connecting people who do the same work in different environments with a different expertise. As, as an example of um, what I mean, I want to use an example of an academia that's so fragmented into you know, different universities, different research groups. And the way it works right now is we have those people kind of located at different universities that collaborate with each, with each other based on their expertise, collaborate internationally, but it's all kind of organic distributed effort that doesn't um, that doesn't come together, that doesn't create those giant international consortia, because every one of those groups is funded independently by funding agencies, by foundations. What we as a community think would be a more efficient way to get to making a synthetic cell, making a actual bioengineering efforts more coordinated is switch to the model where people of the same expertise work together regardless of where they are from. And then they collaborate with people of similar complementary expertise, again, regardless where that other group is from. And most importantly, and that that's the reason why I'm here today is we want to integrate those efforts with everyone who is interested in science. So if anyone is interested in big scientific problems, 
I can't think of a much bigger problem than um, how do you make a living cell from scratch? And that's something that we're not just working on um, as researchers, but we're also working on um, with communities, with citizen science labs, with um, uh, hacker bio community, with people that are interested in kind of a pushing scientific efforts, um, despite not being in academia. And one of the really important things that we need to pay attention to is how do we make sure that everyone is heard? How do we make sure that not one approach dominates the conversation? And that's something really difficult. We obviously, we're right now an effort that's mostly centered in academia, but we also would really like input from the people outside of academia. We would like to know how industry, how citizen science people think about reasons for building cells, how to make engineered cells, how engineering biology can be incorporated into bioeconomy and other of those efforts that um, hopefully create kind of a more sustained um, not just economy, but also models of research, models of science. And speaking of sustainability, one of the biggest um, parts of sustainability is not dying. And so we're very focused on not dying. Um, we're very focused on engineering cells in a way that's safe and secure. And so there's obviously many issues if you set out to build a completely new organism. Obviously, mouse analysis is something that we take very seriously. Dual use concerns are something that we discuss at every step of research. Uh, we try to affect the regulatory and policy considerations. So every regulatory agency, every country does it uh, within the kind of scope of their own biosafety frameworks. And we hope that those biosafety frameworks, al frameworks align. And we talk to research community. We talk to funders and regulators of this research. We also talk to the citizen science. Um, movement and to the general public, to people that actually have um, hands-on experience or interest in this field, to convince them that we're doing it safely and also invite them to work with us. And so speaking of inviting to work with us, one of the things that I'm, uh, I would be really excited to see um, from the communities um, like you guys is, can we have some kind of a red teaming event? Can we probe for vulner vulnerabilities in synthetic cell technologies? What happens if we ask people from all over the world to build the worst possible thing you can imagine based on an on a engineering cells technology? Not just engineering a ribosome that can make a indestructible biomaterial, for example, but engineering a whole synthetic cell system that can do something truly terrible. And those kind of red teaming events serve to kind of probe the vulnerabilities of our system, probe what are the limits um, of our safety protocols and security protocols. And another thing that we uh, are really interested in um, inviting people to work on is figuring out what elements of a cell can actually be built and in what way. So a lot of you have experience in nucleic acid folding, um, and that's just one element of kind of playing to make cell. So obviously in synthetic cells, you have to have um, RNA and DNA that folds properly for certain functions, but we also need a whole bunch of other components. Um, so folding nucleic acids or making um, better ribosomes is just kind of a two small element of building this incredibly complex thing that is a live cell. And that's one of the things um, we really look for input, we look for involvement from, from outside is how can we be better at testing different the kind of assemblies, different ways of building cells. Um, how can we test placing, engineering, any aspect of a living cell? So basically imagine living cells being this chassis that you're allowed to play with. What would you do? How, what kind of cell would you build to make it um, better in any way possible and better by the metric that whatever metric you want to define? And so just to wrap up the end goal of kind of a, my end goal and the end goal of our community is to go from this research community to a worldwide community of people that are interested in engineering biology for engineering every aspect of biology, not just nucleic acids, not just proteins, but engineering every aspect of what can you do with a cell to make it safer, to make it possible to build new tools, build new medicine, and also build a scientific community. Because we're also about building connections between people. We want to build this network of people that think science and think talk science and understand that science is actually something that will help us in um, not just 
specific research questions, but also many kind of real world relevant questions.